Good morning, everyone. My name is Amy Carrera, Shield Healthcare's Corporate Registered Dietitian. Welcome to today's webinar, The Complete Nurse's Guide to Tube Feeding. This one-hour session addresses formula administration, feeding tube site care, troubleshooting complications, nutrition screening, and more. There is one CE contact hour available for this webinar provided by Capital Nursing Education. To get your CE credit, you must register for the webinar, attend for at least 50 minutes, and complete the CE form to the right of your screen. If more than one person is viewing on one computer, you'll complete the group form to the right of the screen. You will receive an email with your CE credit within three to five business days. The webinar will be recorded in case you miss any part of it. You can go to shieldhealthcare.com slash webinars after this live recording to see it. You may also receive CE credit for viewing the recorded webinar. The webinar will be in listen-only mode. If you have a question, please type it into the question box in the control panel on your screen. There will be a question and answer session at the end. We're pleased to welcome Jeff Souza, FNP, of Capital Nursing Education. Jeff Souza attended UC Davis, CSU Sacramento, and Samuel Merritt University, where he completed his master's in nursing. He is a board-certified family nurse practitioner and has been a wound ostomy continence nurse since 1983 after attending the University of Southern California. Jeff is a leader in bringing common sense and quality to the delivery of health services across multiple settings. He is a speaker, author, and advocate for home and community medical care. With over 30 years of experience in a dynamic healthcare environment, he brings the creativity needed to deliver services throughout the changing healthcare market. At this time, I'll turn the presentation over to Jeff. Thank you, Amy. I appreciate the introduction and welcome everyone to A Nurse's Guide to Tube Feeding. Today, we've got a few objectives we want to cover, so we'll get started and spend the next hour together looking into tube feedings, the complications, and the kind of things that you need as nurses to pay attention to as you have when you have patients that have tube feeding in place or even those who may need tube feeding. So we've got objectives for today, identifying types of feeding tubes, recognizing enteral devices with NFIT connectors. For those who don't know what that is, we'll cover that briefly. To demonstrate the appropriate techniques for formula and medication administration, describing the optimal tube site care, looking at complications of tube feeding and how to troubleshoot those. And then we're gonna end up with a little um, nutritional screening as that's certainly part of a nurse's responsibility in evaluating patients to make sure that their um, nutritional needs are being met. So let's start with feeding tubes in general. Feeding tubes in general are um, defined by where in the gut that they are inserted. So nasogastric tubes, of course, everyone's familiar with, coming in through the nose and down into the stomach. Gastrostomy tubes going directly into the stomach in one of a couple of different ways. And jejunal tubes going directly into the, the jejunum. There are actually duodenal that we'll mention in some select cases but the tube is certainly named by where it's located and perhaps how it got there. So let's start um, and look at nasogastric tubes. Nasogastric tubes being the simplest of the type of feeding tubes we would deal with, usually inserted at the bedside or in radiology, depending on the length of tube and the complications or the complexity of the tube. But they're usually indicated for short-term use. Some patients use them long-term and we'll co cover that as well. But the contraindications for a nasogastric tube is the risk of aspiration, uh, the, the possibility of vomiting, delayed gastric emptying, and of course, the irritation that goes along with having a tube stuck through your nose. The next one are G-tubes, uh, gastrostomy tubes, going through the abdominal wall into the stomach. They can be inserted um, uh, endoscopically or um, just percutaneously. So percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy is the long way to say a peg tube. Um, using endoscopic technique, the stomach is brought to the abdominal wall, stabilized, uh, a stoma is made or an opening is made, the tube is inserted. So they are surgical gastrostomy tubes. And then there's something on the inside and something on the outside to hold it in place. So bolster, if you will, as you can see from the diagram, on the inside, there's a balloon filled with water, and on the outside, there is a, a bolster, we'll call it, that goes up against the skin to keep it from moving around. 
Then we have jejunal tubes or J-tubes. Again, same kind of thing, percutaneous endoscopically inserted. Uh, the jejunum is brought against the abdominal wall, as you can see in the picture. Most commonly uh, type surgically placed type of tube. So a percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy, jejunostomy, or just jejunostomy tube. So you can see they're a little different, a little different um, configuration of the tube, but accomplish the same purpose of bypassing some part, portion of the uh, initial alimentary canal, either the mouth, the throat, the esophagus, or in the case of a jejunostomy tube, bypassing the stomach as well. So in addition to these tubes, all of which are long and inserted, the other kind are uh, balloon or low profile, sometimes referred to as button tubes. So um, these can replace the more traditional type of J tubes and G tubes. Once the gastrostomy tract matures um, uh, in about three months, then these can be inserted and they can be very low profile. The top one you see in the picture has a little bit of a tail on it. So you can insert um, your feeding tubes directly into it and cap it off and have support for medication as well as feeding. Um, then the low profile uh, JG tubes are the ones you see in the bottom photo with an anti-reflux valve that prevents leakage of gastric contents in case the cap comes off. But these do require an extension tube to be inserted directly into it before you have um, deal with uh, feeding or um, medication administration. As I mentioned, there's a couple of different types of tubes that go in through the nose, or so we'll generally refer to them as nasoenteric tubes. So nasogastric jejunal tube um, with a single lumen or a double lumen. Again, sometimes inserted at the bedside, but confirmed in radiology, if not inserted in radiology. Uh, these are also known as transpyloric tubes, meaning that they go through the stomach, through the pylorus, and into the small intestine. And nasal duodenal tubes that I mentioned earlier, uh, not quite so far down, just into the duodenum, and are more commonly used in infants and children. So now that we've looked at the tubes and you're familiar with the ends and connectors and those that uh, kind of tubes that you have seen, let's take a little bit of uh, a moment and talk about end fit, enteral connections. You may or may not have seen this, um, but there is a uh, a move to try and get this conversion done. And as you can see from the photo, the traditional kinds of feeding tubes are a slip connector, um, sometimes even a cath tip connector, but more commonly, um, as is demonstrated on the screen, a multi-size kind of cone connector. NFIT is more of a twist connector, similar to a lure lock connector, but with a little bit more twist to it and some other features. Um, this conversion was recommended or uh, approved for moving it forward back in 2013 and uh, in 2015 they had hoped to have this conversion done but as all conversions go um, only about half of hospitals have fully converted um, of course in the rest of the world everyone else has converted to this already so we're just lagging behind because it's a complicated conversion but there is a lot of inventory and it is a, a lot of change. You need to have the syringes, the feeding tubes, the tube surgeons are inserting. All of the parts and pieces need to have the proper ends on them. So the male female connector goes together correctly. So it's no small task to convert an entire organization. This came up because of some of the misconnections that were identified and the FDA had gotten a number of reports that misconnections between enteral devices and non-enteral devices, say IVs, respiratory devices, urinary tubes, et cetera, could cause patient harm, clearly. Uh, certainly you can understand that if back in the day when a, a Foley catheter was put in, used as a temporary J -tube or G tube, um, that the connection of which tube is which could certainly get confused. So the FDA approved NFIT as a solution um, from the safety standpoint and manufacturers have produced those items. It's merely a matter of converting, getting them into the various organizations. Let's just look a little bit closer at the, the NFIT tubes. As I said, there's a, a syringe, the feeding tubes, the tubes that are inserted, the extension tubes, the connector tubes, 
all need to have the end fit connector. And if you look at the bottom picture, you can see most clearly how there's a twist to that connector. So the end fit feeding set tip goes into the continuous feeding port, giving you the ability to have a positive firm connection that one, won't slip out if you're doing a bolus feeding and you put a little pressure on it, you're not gonna pop and end up with enteral nutrition all over the place, but um, also to make sure that the, the feeding is going into the right tube when doing it. So same thing, feeding sets. This gives me a chance, if you look at that picture closely, to introduce the concept, uh, if you have not seen these yet, of a transitional connector, transitional stepped connector. So the end fit feeding set would screw into this little, what I have always called a Christmas tree type connector, a gradiated connector, and then it can fit into the appropriate size feeding tube or feeding extension tube on the other side to make the transition from legacy tubes to end fit tubes. As well as feeding sets, uh, whether they're pump feeding sets, gravity feeding sets, the end tip uh, connector can be used with them and a transitional connector you can see if you look very closely on each of those end fit feeding devices so that they can be connected one to the other. Certainly, as we know, there's a lot of different kinds of syringes and things available. Just to look at what those look like, a cath tip syringe, we all know, lure lock, slip lure, and oral syringes are all different than what the end tip connector provides in this kind of connection. Again, one more look at the end fit. You can see on the syringe that there's a twisted connector that fits in, whether it's fitting into an end fit feeding port as shown on the bottom, or twisting into the transitional connector connecting to a legacy port as is shown on the top. Same with extension sets, feeding tube and extension sets are available with NFIT. Again, on the very far right, this is just one closer look at what the tube would look like. And you can see that cap screws into the device, giving you a much better connection and one that can't be confused between any other tubes that you're using. So let's move from that um, and talk about some of the other things that are part of enteral equipment being used. I'm introduced now, we'll talk a little more in a moment. Introduce the enteral backpack, which allows an enteral feeding pump to be put in and food to be carried, which will certainly allow for independence, improves ambulation, and really improves the quality of life for someone who is on a pump feeding um, schedule and needs to have enteral nutrition going on a more regular basis. <clears throat> So we've talked about the types of tubes, feeding tubes and accessories. We've looked at um, NFIT as uh, it relates to the enteral devices and connectors. And now it's time to move on to looking at appropriate techniques for formula and medication administration. And then we'll come back and describe optimal tube site care, as well as recognizing and troubleshooting complications. So before any um, administration of anything goes into an enteral tube, even if you know it's the enteral tube because of the NFIT connection, you need to make sure that you verify the position. Of course, the tube can migrate from the small bowel to the stomach or the stomach to the esophagus. So we need to make sure that the tube is in the right place before administering anything in it other than water and make sure that um, we're getting the kinds of results from the tube based on where it would be. So the method used for that, as you may have noticed on some of the earlier tubes that have graduation marks, you can take and see um, how far it's inserted. That doesn't necessarily tell you whether it, the tip of it has moved, but tells you whether it's in far enough. You can aspirate uh, gastric residuals, even air auscultation, which isn't the greatest, but may be able to tell you something. And then lastly, x-ray confirmation, which is certainly the gold standard of how we verify a tube is in position. So uh, at the bedside, checking graduation marks is probably the, the most effective. As you can see on this tube, they're measured out. And if you can look very closely to your screen, there's actually numbers showing the centimeters uh, that on the tube so you know where it's inserted. Aspirating uh, gastric residuals is um, one way to do it. Certainly a larger sharp increase may indicate that the J-tube has gotten displaced into the stomach. Uh, looking at the pH of the different aspirates will certainly distinguish between gastric and small bowel placement. Um, negative pressure when attempting to aspirate um, will certainly is another way to detect whether it's migrated at all. 
So as I mentioned, verifying two position here, auscultation, not really the greatest. Um, while certainly we've used it um, and it is one of the easiest, um, it's hard to differentiate sometimes between um, gastric placement, respiratory sounds, other kind of things, normal bowel sounds going on. Um, but it's better than not doing anything. And so uh, x-ray confirmation, as I mentioned, is the, the gold standard. And if there is any doubt, should be the, the way to check and verify the tube's position. So if we've got the tube in position, it's, it's where it's supposed to be, which means it should be able to do what it's supposed to do. We then need to move on to talking about feeding. And there are three primary ways of feeding that we will talk about. Um, of the bolus method, which is an immediate, meaning less than 15 minutes to do a feeding. Uh, gravity, which takes a little longer, uh, requires some kind of pole or something to have gravity in place, and can take a half an hour to an hour. And then pump assisted, if it's going to be longer or there's reason to uh, moderate the amount of feeding or the speed of feeding. So let's start with talking about bolus. Bolus uh, is just a large amount of formula administered rap rapidly through a syringe delivered in approximately 15 minutes. Um, again, feedings are done anywhere from three to as many as eight times a day. And it's certainly appropriate for NG tubes, G tubes, and more importantly, gives the freedom to do other things and not be um, tied to a tube during the day. Um, this is a, another good use for those small short tubes or, or peg type tubes, the button gastrostomies or, or J tubes that we saw earlier but can certainly do a bolus, um, get the food in, and then go on like this young man is about to do to uh, play. Gravity, this is probably what we're most familiar with. For those of you that are in any long-term care setting, certainly this would be the method, uh, often uh, used in home settings too, if people are not as mobile or need to be out and about quite as much. So it requires a little more um, uh, equipment, you have to have a, a feeding bag and um, the time to be able to do it. Again, feeding times are usually about the same, three to eight times daily. It's really a bolus method, but a little bit slower and doesn't require you to have hands on the whole time during the feeding. So that's gonna be, certainly be set up by one. And if there's a caregiver in place, this is an example of where the caregiver could do this, set the patient up to be able to do the feeding. And for patients that are bed bound or much more immobile, um, this certainly is an option that seems appropriate for um, nasogastric tubes as well as for G tubes. And we'll move on to pump assisted. Uh, it can either be continuous or intermittent. Again, this is usually over a longer period of time, 30 to 60 minutes uh, in some pediatric patients, but can be delivered up to 24 hours a day if that's appropriate for the patient in their given condition. Uh, this is certainly appropriate for jejunostomy tubes, as well as gastric and nasogastric tubes, and especially for those who require a slower rate uh, to put it in. It's easier to control and be specific because it's certainly positively pumping it in rather than using gravity and the uh, effect of just a roller clamp to try and um, graduate it. So any kind of modulation um, would certainly be the best way to do that. So uh, we have tubes. We know how we can administer it. So let's do so. So how do we start? Where do we start? Initiating uh, tube feedings. It's a process. And so we need to start a little bit slow to get the gut used to the kind of food that we're going to be giving and the amount that we're going to be giving the schedule of feeding. So with a bolus or a gravity feeding, we really want to start with about 25% of our goal, the total amount that we're going to um, use as the goal. So 25% of that in pediatric patients, um, up to 100% of the goal volume in stable adults as possible. But you need to start with what the total calories are in your goal, the volume of that, and then divide that into the desired number of feedings. And this may take a little bit of um, working with the patient to see. Um, again, the choice between three feedings and eight feedings is primarily on the volume that um, you would be feeding them. So on a pump, though, uh, same thing. We want to graduate up. So we want to start at about 10 to 40 milliliters an hour and then go up from there. So let's talk about going up and advancing that on a, a 
bolus or gravity feeding, we said start with 25% and then increase the volume by 25% per day until the goal is reached. Same kind of thing with a pump. We want to increase it from the um, initial of 10 to 40, wherever we are, to increase it uh, by 10 to 20 milliliters per hour every 8 to 12 hours as tolerated until that goal is reached. So what does tolerated mean? How does that look? What kind of problems can result um, from a tube feeding like this? Well, certainly aspiration is one of them. And so we need to prevent that and do the kind of things. Again, this is dependent on how um, independent or how mobile the patient is, whether the tube feedings are being administered to a bed bound patient or someone who is up and about or able to sit up into a chair. So proper tube placement is the first thing that needs to be assured to prevent aspiration. Um, on a bed bound patient, you want the head of the bed up 30 to 45 degrees both during the feeding and for at least an hour afterwards. Sometimes based on what's going on with the patient, this is a little bit of a difficulty, um, especially those patients who have uh, difficulty laying on their back. But one way or the other, we need to have the head of the bed up so that the food will go in and gravity will work all the way down. And then as far as uh, whether they're tolerating it, we mentioned that earlier. So check for signs of intolerance. Emesis certainly would be one, abdominal dissension another, and perhaps even constipation. Of course, to check, uh, we can look at the residual volume that's left and make sure that uh, we're getting the food in where we want it to. So talking about gastric residual volume, GRV, um, we need to want to check that of Four, every four hours in the first 48 to make sure that they're tolerating and the stomach is emptying. Uh, once we've reached the goal in non-critical patients, a little less frequently. And then from the standpoint of what we would do with that information, if the volume is greater than 250 milliliters twice in a row, um, there may be a requirement for some additional uh, support, some medications to increase gastric motility. Again, tube feeding is different than eating a meal. And so how the, the gastric um, uh, response to that is a little different at, as well. If the um, gastric residual volume is above 500 milliliters, um, we would hold the tube feeding and re reassess. If it's consistently over 500, that's when we would consider something like jejunal feedings just bypassing the entire gastric system. There are some disadvantages with checking gastric residual volume. The, the accuracy of it is certainly um, brought into question and uh, the relationship to how much comes out. Uh, there's a, a potential for clogging the tube when you're pulling something back through it. Um, and also the potential for underfeeding. If you're uh, having the feedings held repeatedly, um, we wanna try and, and make sure the feedings are uh, tolerated. And so if in fact, the excess in gastric residual volume leads you to hold the tube feeding that more than a couple times, we want to be able to look at what other factors need to be addressed, not just uh, merely follow that recommendation and hold feedings when something else may be the, the problem that we need to address. Uh, just real briefly, let me talk about hang times. Hang time meaning how long we want to leave a formula up and the possibility or the uh, ways to do that. So this just goes from sterile formula in an open system to a neonate of um, no more than four hours to um, sterile formula in a closed system can be much longer. Um, for those of us that are in um, <clears throat> home care or in um, a long-term care setting, um, we're more in the eight to 12 hours. If you see 12 hours sterile formula in an open system at home, um, would follow the recommendations of the best practices from the intro nutrition. In enteral nutrition. So let's talk a little bit about formula selection. How do we select formula? What formula? There's lots of different kinds of formulas out there, and it really depends on what the patient's needs are. Are we looking at something just a standard sort of increasing nutrition to an adult patient, or are there special considerations that need to be taken into account? For a standard adult, um, the formula can be in a concentration of one to two um, calories per milliliter with or without fiber, um, but certainly there are specialty disease specific things based on whether there's diabetes we're taking into account, whether there are renal disease that needs to be considered, um, hepatic disease. So there are um, amino acid based or even hydrolyzed formulas, uh, the names on the screen there. 
that can be used in these situations to make certain that the patient's going to tolerate and absorb the nutrition that they need. With infants, it's a little bit uh, different, a little more, few more choices. Uh, standard full-term infant uh, cow milk-based formulas at 20 calories per ounce is common. Those listed, Cinemac, Enfamil, uh, Gerber. Uh, certainly there's a lactose reduced for um, patients who are not tolerating the cow's milk kind of formula. But certainly when you deal with um, premature infants, there are a, a much more um, considerations that need to be taken into a place. Um, so more protein, more calcium, vitamin D for their bones, uh, 22 calories per ounce is a more common dilution um, and can safely be used. That can safely be used for uh, the first year of life. Hydrolyzed or hypoallergenic formulas, amino acid based are all available and so should be considered if working with an infant and coming up with the formula for them. Now, generally that's gonna be um, done by the <clears throat> neonatologist and given you um, some guidance, but just so you know what the parameters are, so you can cross check that and make sure that what's being used fits with the general guidelines. <clears throat> when selecting uh, pediatric formulas, standard again, uh, one to one and a half cows per mil, uh, with it, without fiber, PD Sure and Boost would be um, two of the common ones used. Again, the same kind of hydrolyzed peptide based or amino acid formulas are available for pediatrics as they are for adults and as they are for infants. So let's move on to medication. This can certainly be a problematic area. Um, the most important thing when administering medication is to stop the feeding and flush the tube. At least 15 mLs of water with each medication um, being delivered and deliver all medications separately, flushing between them. So that they're separated and we minimize any contamination or even precipitation of the medications in the tube. So before and after each medication, um, making sure that the medication's not coming into direct contact with the formula <clears throat> and doing each medications separately. So specifically, um, only want to crush those kind of meds that are immediately immediate release. Any other kind of meds we would not want to. So really the best and safest way is to use liquid preparations or liquid forms of the medication uh, when available. And they are generally available for most things. Uh, you can dilute the medications. You wanna prevent clogging and the um, intensity that they would cause possibly even leading to diarrhea. So this is where you'd use the 60 to 30 to 60 ml um, oral or enteral syringes to make sure that you're getting adequate flushing and clearing the medication from the line, um, feeding from the line before the medication, the medication from the line before you go back to feeding. So let's stop and take another look at our objectives and what we've covered so far. We've identified the types of feeding tubes and accessories. We've reviewed the progress of the NFIT conversion We've demonstrated the appropriate techniques for formula medication administration. So now let's turn our attention to <clears throat> uh, optimal tube site care. So we're gonna look first at optimal, what we should do, what should be normal, and then we'll spend some time on troubleshooting. So tube and site care, daily, check the tube's position. We don't wanna have any redness, irritation, leakage around the exit site. Uh, if it's a nasogastric tube or nasal jejunal tube, you want to check the nares um, and, and cleanse them with water. Um, in the bolster side, we want to make sure that, in the short tube side, we want to look underneath and make sure there's no um, irritation going on there. We want to rotate that end, the, the whole end of the tube and the bolster or the little cushion that's underneath it. Um, uh, the, from the external side, a quarter of a turn, just to make sure it's not adhering in um, anywhere along the track. And then we want to check the external uh, bolster height, both sitting and supine. Um, we should have not more than two to three millimeters uh, from the, between the skin and the bolster itself. So looking at tube and site care, we want to flush the tube with um, water before and after each use, routinely with jejunal tubes, uh, 30 mLs every four hours. And then that's a good time to check residual um, to prevent uh, clogging of the tube. Other liquids, especially acidic ones, can cause clogging risk, and we want to avoid that because there's nothing worse than getting the tube clogged, not being able to 
uh, fix it and having to reinsert the tube or send the patient back to the hospital for a um, radiographically inserted tube. So the other things that we want to do, especially for these uh, short tubes weekly and before use, we want to check the balloon volume and test for leaks. So this is simply done by deflating the balloon, withdrawing the water, noting the amount. If more than five millimeters have been lost, or five milliliters have been lost, we need to notify the physician. Uh, you want to reinflate the tube with the recommended amount of sterile water. We don't want to use air because that can seep out the balloon and lead to it leaking and um, uh, coming, becoming dislodged. And we don't want to use saline because that can crystallize and clog the access port and present other problems as well. So uh, daily, just a quick summary of the skincare tips. Washing hands is always um, necessary, but rotating the tube, uh, except for J-tubes, rotating the tube a quarter of a turn, check the external bolt bolster height, I said two to three millimeters, which is roughly the size of a dime. Uh, securing the tube, uh, do not secure it with the safety pin that is shown in the picture. There are um, a lot of different securement devices, um, some that specifically can um, ensure the 90 degree angle exit of the tube from the skin. And that's one of the benefits of the small button tubes is that you avoid the excess tube on the outside. So. <clears throat> All of those securement devices, other than the um, um, roll of a piece of gauze and tape, um, they run somewhere between $10 and $20 a piece of different uh, specific devices that a lot of manufacturers make that have a, uh, an adhesive to the skin and a clip on the tube that gets a secure connection to it. And always we wanna keep it clean and dry. Uh, we shouldn't expect or tolerate um, continued or excessive amounts of moisture uh, around the skin. We'll cover what that can be done, how that can be dealt with as we move on to looking at some of the complications. So we've gone from optimal site care, so we want to troubleshoot and deal with some of the complications of tube feedings. The most common complication is going to be excess leakage. So we want to check the external bolster height and adjust properly, just put it down um, lightly, snugly against the skin, and check the balloon volume. Both of those can contribute to leaking if the uh, tube is not sealed on the inside or is not secure enough on the outside. Uh, Short-term dressing may be appropriate to absorb some of that drainage and pull it away from the skin, and certainly there are things that can be done to protect this, the skin itself. If the stoma is enlarged, um, the opening that has been put in there, if that becomes too large for the particular tube, it may mean that tube replacement needs to happen so that there's a better fit. And that's certainly something that can happen over time. And you need to be able to um, be aware of that as the possibility and keep your eyes on that from happening. The other complication is a dislodged feeding tube. So you have an opening, but the tube has come out for whatever reason it has come out. And so you need to cover the gauze and contact the physician so a, a plan can be put in place quickly as to what kind of things can be done to do that. If it cannot be replaced within the next uh, two to four hours, uh, often a temporary catheter or uh, is used <clears throat> or a tube uh, taped in place to prevent the stoma from closure. And of course, do not use a temporary catheter ever for feeding. Um, because placement's not been checked and we need to make sure that it's in the proper place and everything is secure before restarting feeding and or the administration of any medications. The other complication would be a clogged feeding tube. The easiest way is to just push a little warm water into the tube with a 60 ml syringe, uh, gently pushing and pulling the plunger to loosen the clog can um, accomplish that. Uh, but avoid pulling back on the plunger if you have a J tube. We don't want to pull back and, and uh, cause suction against the interior of the intestine. Uh, you can also uh, put fluid in and clamp the tube, letting water kind of soak for a few minutes in an effort to um, clear the tube. And if it's an external tube or with an external tail on the tube, you can try gently massaging the tubing with your fingers and see if that doesn't um, help. 
But sometimes if it's still clogged, we need to move on from there. And there are a couple of different ways. Um, enzymatic, and here's a list of some of the kinds of things that can help um, do that uh, to try and dissolve the clog. And then mechanical, more of a, a brush or a way to be able to get in and clear the tubing. So recurrent clogs, you really need to look at the medications and the administration, kind of what's been going on, what kind of flushing has happened. There shouldn't be recurrent clogs if flushing and medication administration protocols are followed, but take a look at that. We certainly don't want to use anything caustic or anything other than um, an enzyme type uh, clear or water. We can damage the tube and or the patient. So neither of those would help. Other complications would be nausea and vomiting. But think of just the normal kinds of things we talked about at the beginning of initiating um, uh, tube feeding, what kinds of things we are trying, how we're trying to avoid those, this particular complication. So the speed of administration, whether it's high form or high administration rate or a high formula concentration, um, both can contribute to nausea but also there could be some contamination of the formula that's causing the patient to be nauseous or some bowel dysfunction, either bacterial overgrowth or impaction, both can lead to nausea and vomiting. Uh, medication side effects. So look and see exactly um, what kind of things are a number of things that contribute to, can contribute to nausea and vomiting. Just because the patient has a feeding tube doesn't mean it's necessarily related to formula, but that's certainly a good place to start. As we all know, nausea and vomiting goes right along with diarrhea. So the same kind of things can cause diarrhea as causes nausea and vomiting. So high administration rate, high formula concentration, formula contamination, the list is basically exactly the same. And just the opposite of that, constipation. Um, potential causes, of course, would be inadequate uh, fluid or fiber intake. But even the side effect of medications, again, you need to look at all the factors that are involved. So especially narcotics um, are going to affect uh, constipation. Inactivity is going to affect constipation. Any kind of GI dysmobility is going to affect constipation as well. And of course, bowel obstruction. Now, um, I know in the long-term care setting, they are very concerned of keeping track of what's going on and who's constipated and who's not, and did you move your bowels today? Um, we in home care sometimes aren't as attuned to that. So certainly that would be the question to ask. To um, avoid constipation is much easier than trying to treat it. So be sure to keep track of the patient as with all um, patients that have either mobility or medications or other kinds of things. Uh, even age that lead to the possibility of constipation. We want to be able to look and make sure that um, those things are being addressed and we haven't really missed out on anything that could be contributing to that for this patient. Again, looking at all things, not just the tube feedings. So we've covered those kinds of things. Um, let's take a moment and look at, well, who even needs enteral nutrition? Why would we start? And let's talk about uh, screening for nutrition. What kinds of things do we need to look at? Who's looking? Why and when do we look? So performing um, nutrition screening, nurses, of course, registered dietitians, dietitian tech, dietetic technicians, um, all are involved in the process, as is the physician. Screening for nutrition needs to not only occur for those that are on tube feeding, but really should be a part of the care plan for any of the patients that we see. If we're seeing them, then they probably have something going on disease-wise, and they have something going on that can potentially affect their nutrition. Really, the purpose for screening is to identify those patients that are at risk for malnutrition, not those that have already gotten there, but trying to prevent it. Let's look at who we can identify as risk for malnutrition and refer at-risk patients to a dietitian for further intervention doing a more detailed nutrition assessment and putting together a nutrition plan. This complies not only with government regulations, but the Joint Commission, home health organizations, as well as others should have some systematic way to identify patients at nutritional risk, not just on the initial assessment, but on some recurring basis to look as you're monitoring and working with that patient to see what kind of um, things have contributed that. Malnutrition can certainly complicate um, our goals, whether we're doing with wound care or mobility or even independent self-care. A malnourished patient is not going to meet those, those goals, 
So we need to be sure to address it so that we can make progress on all of the things that we're working with that client to address. So the process of nutrition screening, first identify patients needing to be screened and individual organizations may have this policy. Check with yours and see what the policy is. See if it's being followed or if there even is one. It certainly starts with reviewing the medical information, looking at signs and symptoms, identifying psychosocial and economic factors. If this is not nursing, I don't know what is. <clears throat> so identifying those patients that need nutrition screening. Uh, conditions with nutritional impact include COPD, cancer, renal disease, gastrointestinal diseases, all which have some effect or change the nutritional needs of a particular patient. Uh, restrictive diet, for one reason or another, can lead to malnutrition. Um, nutrition support, if they have tube feeding, is it adequate now versus when they started? What kind of things might need to be looked at? That? Are they still tolerating it? You want to make sure that malnutrition is not contributing to the disease process. Uh, we may sometimes have a tendency to assume that the disease is what they have and be a little over-focused on that. Be sure to step back and look at the whole patient and see, is the disease causing a change in their eating habits? Does it in fact affect their ability to uh, digest food, um, eat food, take food? Um, there could be uh, an additional need for nutritional support and a tube feeding, if that is one of the, the factors, may certainly affect that. And let's not leave out medications. Medications can influence appetite and cause GI symptoms, which will also lead to um, nutritional deficits. So nutritional screening, what are you looking for when reviewing that medical information? Diagnosis, history and physical, medications, food allergies, and most importantly, weight history. What is their weight? Has it been changing? Has it been decreasing? How much has it been decreasing? Really need to start with, uh, is there some kind of weight loss occurring from their usual UBW, usual body weight? So where have they been and what kind of weight loss have they experiencing? 2% over, 2% uh, in a week is certainly considered significant, 5% a month uh, or 10%, roughly um, 10 pounds over six months should be looked at. So anything along that continuum should be looked into. And in children, any weight loss should be investigated. Uh, children should certainly be increasing weight on a regular basis, so any drop is worth looking into. But where are they overall? I mean, you, their usual may even be low, and so we talk about ideal body weight, IBW. So ideal body weight, somewhere um, between the 80th and 130th percentile um, would be um, ideal body weight, or they need to be within 80 to 130 percent of their ideal body weight. Uh, the growth chart you've seen inside, we look at that for pediatrics often. We don't usually look at it for adults, but it certainly can give us some kind of idea of where that individual is, whether they're below the third or above the 95th percentile. Other kind of measurements that are easy to do, especially in the home health environment, some more specific for pediatrics, but in all cases, um, pediatrics uh, height, length, uh, head circumference are important. Uh, BMI will give you um, some kind of indication of what's going on with that patient. Body fat or lean body mass will give us. And then an easy one is the tricep skin fold. So just measuring the subcutaneous uh, adipose tissue by measuring the thickness um, in the triceps area. Muscle arm circumference is another one, measuring the underlying muscle tissue. That certainly is one of the first things to waste. And so, um, being able to know what that was is one of the measurements that we can look at to see um, kind of where the patient is. When trying to evaluate that, we need to look at all the symptoms, all the symptoms that are involved, all the, the factors that are involved in, um, in eating. Uh, so often those things are silent, aren't mentioned, the patient's been tolerating them for a long period of time, so they're not going to offer them up. We really need to ask. Uh, difficulty uh, in chewing, whether it's from poor dental status, could be the case even in pediatric patients, or ill-fitting dentures in the elderly population. Any difficulty swallowing, mouth sores, in infants, uh, suck and swallow reflexes, but these are things that have usually come up slowly on the patients and are things they've adjusted to, not things they think to mention. So you have the opportunity to ask them 
and see is this in fact part of the problem that they're dealing with. Other signs and symptoms that can lead to malnutrition, gastrointestinal problems, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, of course, um, things that increase the caloric need, pressure ulcers, uh, dehydration has an effect as well. Um, notice often by decreased urinary output, but dry membranes, thick saliva, increased pulse, decreased blood pressure are all the signs and symptoms you would look at in a quick screening to be able to understand, do they have um, a nutritional need that is going unmet? There are also a couple of tools that we can use, validated um, screening tools. This one by the American Academy of Family Physicians is known as the DTERM questionnaire. It has 10 questions, um, but it covers eating, eating poorly, disease, uh, economic hardship, social interaction, time, uh, multiple medications, uh, weight loss, need for assistance and self-care. And this is a very quick form. You can find it online by just searching DTERM and screening. And um, there are a number of questions, points are given for each, each question, and the total score, um, whether between two and 20, uh, gives you an idea about how much risk they're at, and certainly is a quick and easy tool to be able um, to use. One of the more um, uh, involved tools is the Subjective Global Assessment, SGA. Uh, it looks at the history of weight change, dietary intake, take GI symptoms, disease, uh, physical, um, and the results of this test uh, comes up with a rating A, B, or C. Um, this distinguishes malnutrition from the, just separates out the malnutrition from the other disease consequences that may be going on. Um, this you can also find by going to uh, www.subjectiveglobalassessment.com. Uh, this screening tool must be, is a, one that has to be purchased, but you can purchase it for $8.95 uh, to get the PDF form to be able to use it quick and easily to evaluate patients. Uh, what's most important is that it's very predictive, it's very reliable, and using it gives you the opportunity to really change the patient's outcome by separating um, the disease from any nutritional deficits and being able to supplement those, uh, move to supplement those deficits so that the disease itself will improve. Nurses are certainly at a point of, uh, in, a, in a position to advocate for patients. Uh, certainly this should be something that is continued screening nutritional assessment uh, right along with evaluating those two feedings. And so I think this really gives us a good place to um, conclude this presentation and give you as nurses the ability and the tools that you need to be able to assess those patients and advocate for them where necessary, certainly by identifying any nutritional needs, but understanding those that are on feeding tubes to be able to care for them in the best possible way. Uh, thank you for taking the time to spend with us today on this presentation. There are a few references here that are in the handout that you can see to be able to um, look up some of these things. I've given some of the rest of them in the presentation, but I thank you um, for being here and um, certainly we'll have a couple of moments to be able to take some questions as well. Great, thank you so much, Jeff. That was very thorough. I think you covered um, pretty much everything a nurse um, or a caregiver even needs to know about tube feeding in terms of the basic information. You do have um, a few questions, um, so we'll kind of tag team on these. Um, the first one is about checking gastric residual volumes at home. Um, is that something that somebody needs to do when they're on tube feeding at home? What do you think about that? Well, yeah, I, I think so. It's not, again, if you've got someone who's on a stable tube feeding and not having any complications, it's probably not going to give you much information. Um, certainly, it's more important when you're um, beginning tube feedings or if there's any changes in the, in the patient's condition. You know, at home, is kind of a broad, the patient's at home. Are they an ambulatory patient? Are they a bedbound patient? There's a lot more things that contribute to the efficacy of a tube feeding. But certainly checking is not gonna hurt anything um, to see if in fact they're emptying within those two to four hours. Mm -hmm. Sure, um, and then I would just add that looking at the big picture as well, not just relying on residuals, but looking at abdominal distension, nausea and vomiting, loose stools, GI discomfort, um, and other indicators of tolerance. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, another question that came up, what's the best way to treat hypergranulation tissue on the stoma site? 
Oh, oh, that's, that's like, like, wait a minute, is this the right lecture? <laughs> yes, that, that is an easy one. <laughs> Silver nitrate. <laughs> yeah, okay. silver nitrate sticks are the, the best way to treat any uh, hypergranulation around any stoma. Um, and usually we, we treat it, you know, once every uh, two to three days until the tissue kind of knocks it down. But for those who aren't familiar, silver nitrate is just a stick and on the end of it is um, silver nitrate. Um, some patients have a little, little uh, sensation when they feel it, but not a lot. But it literally just... Uh, cauterizes, uh, chemically burns the top layer of tissue. And so you can do that until that sloughs and continue to do it every um, uh, three to four days until the all the hypergranulation tissue is, is gone. Okay. How about the type of water to flush the tube? Does someone need to use sterile water or distilled water or some special type of water for to flush their tube under regular circumstances? Well, I'm going to guess that regular circumstances mean that you're on water from a city treatment plant, and then I would say that's okay. Um, but, you know, if there's some question about the water, you can certainly use bottled water. I'm not a fan of bottled water for anything, but um, the you know, sterile water is not necessary to flush the tubing. Um, it is necessary probably if you're using, um, if you're trying to inflate or de dealing with the inflation deflation of the balloon, simply because we want to make sure there are no contaminants whatsoever there. Okay, great. Um, another question that came up is about, um, is about breast milk. We didn't mention that in our webinar. And the question just came up, is breast milk used um, for tube feeding? I, I would say absolutely. Um, there are a lot of... Certainly. Specific recommendations to doing that. What, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, the, yeah, absolutely. Breast milk is used for tube feeding, um, and you know, to, to preserve the possibility of breastfeeding after the tube feeding is done, it's kind of a requirement to pump and be able to use breast milk in that way. Um, so yes, and certainly we all are aware of the, the benefits of breast milk over any of the the. Uh, packaged formulas that are available. So yes, again no particular recommendation like with anything else you you know for different reasons you want to be able to be sure that you're flushing very well simply because breast milk over time from um, newborn over the first couple of months changes in consistency and content so you want to make sure that that flushing is done very fairly thoroughly mm -hmm. um sure and i would add that there are um there's a particular pump and feeding bags um that can be more advantageous more advantageous for breast milk because there's less wastage in the line um, and there's an ability to toggle between formula and breast milk so you can deal with those different viscosities um, if you are putting it through a, a pump. Um, another question that came up would be, um, let's say someone's using a syringe for bolus feeds, how often do they need to replace that syringe? Ah. What, what, do you have a recommendation that you would use on this one, Amy? I do. Yeah, I would say use a new syringe every day. <laughs> yeah, you can rinse <laughs> it out and use it throughout the day, um, but it should be replaced every 24 hours. Great. Okay. Agreed. Um, yeah. And let's see if some other questions just came through. Um, this is a favorite one of, of dietitians. Is it okay to use Sprite or Coke to, to uh, unclog a feeding tube? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Okay. Wait, 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 what was the first one? What was before Coke? Sprite. So, so oh, Sprite. Sprite. I'm like, Sprite. Okay. I think you're saying spray. Okay, Sprite or Coke. Well, I mean, I like my Coke straight up the nose, so I don't wouldn't put it in my feet. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Just kidding. Go ahead, Amy. Couldn't oh, resist. Well, I would say that it's, it's been shown that water is definitely superior um, to clear for use as flushing and also to clear a clogged tube and that anything that has acid in it, if there's formula precipitate in your clog, then that could actually exacerbate the issue. So water is always the best um, fluid of choice. And let's see. One I, other did, I did make it. I did make a comment about not using anything caustic to be able to flush a tube, and we've all exactly. seen the YouTube commercials that to, to, or the YouTube videos to show us what to do with Coke. Sure, I mean I've seen people use meat tenderizer and all, all kinds of things to get sure. through there. 
Um, another one came up about skin stuff here. Um, is it necessary to apply gauze at the tube site if there's no drainage? No, 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 no real benefit. Mm -hmm. um, there are other things you can do to protect the skin if you're concerned about it, but um, there's not a reason to be able to put a piece of gauze there just to say you did. Sure. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Keeping the area clean and dry is, is really all you need to do. Let me, let me make a comment about that, though, real quick about gauze, because what I've seen often is that um, whether it's a two by two, fold four by four, whatever, um, often because it's what's mostly available, um, uh, staff will take that piece of regular cotton gauze and make a cut in it so it's slit. And that's really not recommended because you have a lot of loose strings and they can get involved or get caught up in any of that and just really difficult to deal with. So I would not use a cut piece of gauze uh, it, at any point. Cotton, okay. just regular cotton gauze, cut it. So not really best. Slit gauze, it should be pre slit. Yep. Okay, good. Um, yeah, or, or, or a piece of like telpha. You know, something that's not doesn't have the the strings on, not like a cotton woven gauze. But a piece of, if you're going to do that, if you're going to use something, you know, a piece of telephone would would be better because then you're not going to end up with the strings loose. Okay, thank you. Um, a question came up about um, storing formula or storing what to do with the feeding bag if you're feeding via pump and you have several feedings throughout the day. Is it better to rinse the bag out? And let it dry and then put formula in it or is it better to just stick that bag in the fridge um i've recently read um, a small study about this that showed that actually just taking that bag with the formula and the tubing and all that stuff just taking it right off the pump um, and sticking it in the fridge actually um, grew fewer bacteria than rinsing the bag and saving it for later use That's okay come across <laughs> Okay, I could see that could how that could work. Sure, I'm sure it depends on a lot of different factors, but and let's say, um, could you gently pull back daily on tubing? Okay, so I think someone's asking about um, checking the water in the balloon. Should you gently pull back on the tubing to make sure that the balloon has enough water? Um, I think we mentioned that in the presentation in terms of making sure the tube fits right, so to speak, and making sure there's enough water mm -hmm. in it. You actually mm -hmm. would kind of check how much space is in between the skin and the external bolster. Um, mm -hmm. You could also check the fluid. How often do you suggest? I know there's some GI, GI doctors out there that have specific recommendations to their patients for checking. Sure. I sure. would go with their recommendations if if they have any otherwise i think some people might um do it weekly or whatever yeah there's a risk i mean you need to know what you're doing if you're using a like a, a button kind of tube and you're not comfortable or haven't frequently done that you don't want to be checking the fluid and dislodge the tube while you're at it so it, you right. know again de depending who the the gi that inserted it may have some fairly strong opinions about how that gets done mm -hmm. okay sure Let's see. Um, I have a question about are there specific guidelines or recommendations about tube feeding that um, someone should refer to? Um, I can definitely recommend um, a recent publication that Aspen did, um, Aspen Safe Practices for Enteral Nutrition Therapy. That's the American Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition. Um, they recently came out with some new guidelines for safety um, with enteral nutrition therapy. So that's a good resource. To have, as well as there's an older publication from 2009 that they put out, Enteral Nutrition Practice Recommendations, that's an oldie but goodie as well. Do you have any additional resources that you like to use? No, I don't. Those are best. I would always turn to Aspen um, for what recommendations they've published because they're in the position to do that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I think we have time for one more question here. Let's see. Which one which one should I choose? <laughs> There's a lot of good questions on here. Well, let me say let me say this while you're uh, you can still choose one, but I'm saying, you know, send all those questions in. If you have those questions, we'll happily answer them. If you know, hopefully they came in with email addresses, we routinely um, provide that kind of um, feedback to any questions that we didn't get answered. Mhm. Mm okay. 
Well, you know what? We, we just hit the 10 o'clock hour, so let's let's do it that way. If, if your question didn't get answered, um, we'll send you an answer via email. And, um, and certainly, you can always log on to the website and, and ask another question at shieldhealthcare.com. That's absolutely true. You can always go to our nutrition community. Um, in fact, if you want to, oh, well, I almost forgot to mention that. So we have a caregiving contest that ends on the 31st. Um, so caregivers that are out there that submit at least 150 words to kind of giving advice to other caregivers, um, you have an opportunity to win one of three $500 gift cards just for providing that advice. And then on that final slide that I would want to point out is that um, we do have a pediatric tube feeding guide um, as well as an adult version of that. Um, but someone can go onto our website and request a free copy of our tube feeding your child at home guide by just going to shieldhealthcare.com slash nutrition and then you'll see a little button on the right hand side to request your free copy. Great. And with that, I want to thank you, Jeff, for your time and, and expertise. Um, and I want to thank everyone for attending. Again, you'll get your questions answered uh, via email. And everybody, have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.